All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Adria Katz. Um, I'm the Managing Director at the Multicultural Arts Center, and I'm really grateful to have Adriana Pratt here with us tonight, um, one of our, or the current artists on display in our gallery with her gorgeous work. Um, and the ex exhibition is called Topographies of the Collective Misfortunes. And we've all been really taken with the work and we um, have so many questions here at the Art Center. So we've been asking her ourselves and we're hopeful that tonight she'll be able to share some of that with you and also um, take some of your questions. So I'd love for you all to uh, participate in this conversation with questions uh, in the chat Feel free to share a little bit about how you know Adriana in the chat or um, introduce where you're calling in from. And um, feel free also at the end, we'll have time for questions and comments. So you're, you'll, you're welcome to unmute yourself at that point and share if you are willing to do so. Um, I wanna also acknowledge here at the Multicultural Arts Center that we are on the ancestral and present day lands of the Nipmuc and the Massachusetts people. And we are also in meeting in a virtual space right now. And I uh, have a digital land acknowledgement by an artist named Adrian Wong um, of Spiderweb Collaborative that I think speaks to uh, the importance of acknowledging the impact of uh, digital technologies on Indigenous and Native people. So what she has shared, and I'll share a little bit about her too, if you want to learn more about Adrian Wong. Um, Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities, given even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make, leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So with that, I would love to welcome to the stage Adriana Pratt. Um, and we, as I said, she's going to share a little bit about her experience and her work and her process, and then we would love to have your participation. Uh, if you don't already know, she is an academically trained scientist with a PhD in biophysics, and after moving to the USA from Argentina, a more introspective life revealed her calling to become a visual artist. Her abstract paintings often evoke maps, islands, or informed by her scientific background, the cells of organisms. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Adriana to tell us a little bit about the work that's on display in topographies of the collective misfortunes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to you, Zoe, who is now here, and everyone at the Multicultural Arts Center who has been amazing to me and who is giving a temporary home, a beautiful home, to my artworks in your gorgeous gallery space. And also thank you, all of you that are calling from so the, all the corners of the world that I care so much and we care so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, today, it, May 20th, it, it has been designated Endangered Endang Species Day. Uh, so it's a very special day to, 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 to talk about what I'm planning to talk. Uh, I wanted to focus on a few of my artworks to provide some insight into my art story, into my process, and uh, my intention with this exhibit. Uh, the exhibit consists of 28 uh, paintings uh, that are made uh, are recent and they are oil based or acrylic based. And I hope that some of you, whoever is here has a chance to see them. Um, they are the product of my passion to create surfaces that help me ground my thoughts uh, on current global calamities. And, and truly, there are so many calamities uh, currently, including, of course, the tragedy of the war in Ukraine. And my heart goes out to the victims of this horrible war. However, my exhibit focuses on the human-made clim climate crisis and uh, on the COVID pandemic. Uh, I believe um, that creating art brings to life an element of beauty of mystery, 
of reflection, uh, especially in places or situations um, that otherwise um, maybe we are facing difficulties, frustrations, or, or simply questions that haunt us. Um, I have always painted from a place of emotion, uh, focusing on dilemmas, um, following a, a physical impulse and urge to intuitively play with my materials, with my art materials, uh, building, layering, covering, unraveling, bringing together painted thoughts, if you will, that did not exist in the physical world, but that perhaps were alive in another I think that uh, I hear a lot of background noise. I just muted a couple people, I apologize. Okay, 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 no problem. So, um, so anyway, I guess what I was saying is that I came with this idea of bringing thoughts, physical thoughts that didn't exist in the physical world but that and perhaps were in my you know in the spiritual level in my mind um so this is a bit about my process of so about what i'm thinking usually or what i've been thinking before i starting being more inclined to do um the work that has to do with climate crisis um so a few years ago, I had a life-changing experience uh, at an art residency in Reykjavik, Iceland, um, at the Association of Icelandic Visual Artists, SIM, uh, from where a friend of mine is actually here today, Rosanna. Thank you so much for calling. I met her during that uh, residency. Um, and my intention uh, when I traveled to this residency was to explore questions of identity. That's what I wanted to do. But I, I, and I have chosen Iceland because of the critical commitment that this country has uh, to the environment and their eco-friendly priority, which is so aligned with my own personal priority or urgency. I had the hunch when I when I did that that um, perhaps the Icelandic landscape was going to inform my art exploration, and sure enough. Upon arrival to this singular country, the beauty and the drama of the landscapes and the geographies was breathtaking. And uh, the experience of the scenery, and in particular, the constant evolution of the landscape and the sense of intimacy in a way of immediacy with the land was overwhelming. And I felt like I, nothing that I had ever seen before. Uh, and it indeed influenced my uh, my work to change the focus of my artworks and my painting forever. Uh, so we can now go to the first slide. Um, that is called Lavalov. It's a painting, Lavalov. Um, I remember working in my studio uh, at the residency in Reykjavik in this relatively small painting, um, Lava Love, uh, that is not in the show. It's not in the Multicultural Center. It's the only one that is not in the show. And when I was doing this, I had the impulse to draw the outline that you see uh, freehand with ink pen. I'm very likely influenced by the fact that I was constantly and obsessively scrutinizing the map of Iceland to discover the places that I wanted to go to or that I have gone to, that I wanted to explore. Uh, but since I was exploring for my own sake, right, for my own pr uh, practice and my the purpose of original purpose of my art um, residency because I was exploring my memories. I was asking myself questions about my past, about my identity. My first thoughts while painting it were the, about my maternal and societal mandates, which were a lot. Um, and with these thoughts, I found myself introducing what I now understand are symbols of my mind and my will being manipulated by these obligations uh, which are the red contaminants that you see in the inside the outline. So all that uh, that is there, that is, uh, ironically, I call this lava law because it's, I will tell you, it's 
based a bit on the lava that I saw, you know, the volcanoes, you know, that I, I knew they had the lava inside the ground, but also about the love of my mother uh, that was trying to mandate my will. So at the same time, I could not help thinking that what I was creating was also evocative of the cells of organisms, <laughs> like the ones that I have studied or I, I looked at so many times under the microscope. However, while I was adding, especially at the act of adding these contaminant, contaminant symbols, these marks in red, I could feel a shift in my mind. And I recall how I realized I was channeling my view about how our local and global lands and geographies have been exploited and polluted by humans throughout the centuries, through the years without a clear plan, except was that that was driven by ambition and by fin financial gain. And the feeling of having this switch in my mind was overpowering. Um, at that moment, uh, I realized that this when my art started to reflect my thoughts about the environment and the urgency to act. And again, I call it lava love because of this duality. The, all we saw during our trips uh, or, or tours uh, along the insular country was lava fields, volcanoes, glaciers, mountains, moss. Uh, so this uh, double entendre, if you will, about the, the lava, lava love um, had to do with that duality and, and especially the love of my mom. So the next slide, please. So after Lava Love, my next painting that is called Map of the End of the World was really the, the truly the first piece that I executed completely meditating about my concern uh, about the current state of the environment. And I was now using this, I guess, newly incorporated aesthetic of the depicting maps or islands or cells uh, type of imagery. Uh, I was also feeling or having ideas of vintage maps that were coming up during this execution of this uh, a small but I believe powerful painting, which I also use in a number of other paintings. This image was painted on a small, very small canvas that a friend of mine has gifted me that I carried in my backpack to Iceland. Um, and I believe it's the only, but uh, the only canvas that I put there. And I use acrylics and acrylic and ink pens that um, to make it, and I believe oil pastel, uh, I describe it there, uh, which are materials that I tend to use in my practice to this day. Uh, but uh, those were the materials that I carry on thinking that I use include them, um, you know, in a, in a residency. While making this painting, I wonder about the current state of the world regarding global warming and all the associated catastrophes, such as world fires, extreme weather, flooding, hurricanes, all these phenomena that we tend to see now more and more in our communities and in our countries, unfortunately. A feeling of despair really took over my thoughts. I was wondering, I had all these thoughts, all these questions, which don't have an answer. Uh, how much more tragedy does it need to occur in the world, in our vast but finite habitat, for humans to produce substantial change to revert this crisis? Will we be able? to reverse the current climate crisis trends, which scientists always are warning us and alarming us so much about. Will we be able to revert the course while ecosystems are still able to adapt? And until when? It was really, until when? While the title of my painting evokes thoughts of doomsday, I hope that the colors and textures I use are symbolic of my wishful <laughs> beliefs that it is still time to act and reverse the course of this terrible calamity to resolve this urgent crisis. So the next slide. Once I was back from my residency, my studio here in Cambridge, I continued to create surfaces 
while reflecting on the gravity of the environmental crisis. So I continued what I call my climate crisis series. And this is, you know, a, a, a painting that belongs to that series. Like in many other aspects of my life, I became more aware of my dilemma of what materials to use in my practice that are better for the environment. It's, it's a struggle, it's, it's a terrible thing because I wanted to avoid falling in the consumeristic trap. And what I started thinking is um, in terms of uh, what is called the five R's of sustainability, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, or recycle. So I started using painting supports, at least, not yet painting, but painting supports that are alternatives to new stretch canvases like the ones that you can buy on the stores that otherwise I would love to use, but I refuse to use. So I started to experiment painting on corrugated cardboard from packaging materials, like the one I use for this painting, which is called Changes on Its Way. And for most of the paintings on the show, and I wanted to show just oh, out of the way. I wanted to show here that is it's a very good quality that my husband actually brings for me from the lab where he works. Very good um, quality cardboard that is not the cardboard, you know, the typical one from uh, other, you know, um, lower quality. Um, boxes. Um, in any event, um, talking about the theme of this painting, uh, one of the themes that I use in my climate crisis uh, series is that of maps that are changing due to the ocean water rising due to the global warming. And in this painting and in many more of the series, the topographies that I introduced delineate approximate concentric maps so, um, which are, if you will, suggestive of the coastlands, uh, of the lands of the ecosystem, the coastlines, for example, the coastline of an island um, th that is changing due to the ocean water rising. And uh, so, I, I play is not, uh, is not at all uh, related to any, it's all fictional, you know, it's all, you know, my, my uh, own uh, imagination coming over, but if you think about it, it's, it's what, I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking is that a certain map, of, or for example, of an island would be a certain way, but if the water is rising, it will be shorter, smaller, smaller, and, and smaller. And uh, the water rising, um, or the water, the water, uh, the level of the water rising is mostly due to um, a combination of factors um, found with global warming. One is uh, the melting of the water of the glaciers and the ice sheets. And uh, it's also because of thermal expansion of seawater as, it, as, as the water warms up. And uh, the terrible thing is that as global warming continues with the consequent water rising, some islands and lands are doomed to disappear unless we act. Next slide, please. So this painting is called Pollution and the Gold, and it's another acrylic media on corrugated cardboard uh, that is in the show, like all the other ones that I'm showing. And it resulted from my working and reworking layer after layer while imagining the immensity of the exploitation that took place over centuries of exploration that humans have been involved with. The massiveness of itineraries to digging expedition to exploit the vital and finite natural resources. Gold, gemstones, water, fossil fuel, you name it all the things that are found underground or even in our oceans. So this theme in some of my paintings is symbolic of the maps, geographies, or even is symbolic of our planet as a whole in, its, in their contents, constant a struggle to survive, morphing and adapting and mutating under the endless pressure of human-induced exploitation and environmental change. 
Next slide, please. So changing the big gears, but not completely. Uh, this painting or this slide shows a painting from my pandemic series. So that uh, in the show, I have a few paintings that are um, pandemic related that were uh, conceived while I was more concerned or, or when I was ruminating about the pandemic, the COVID pandemic calamity. Um, but I, I will show only two of them. I reflected on the emotions that the COVID-19 pandemic was bringing to my mood and my psyche. So layer after layer, the way I usually do things in my painting, I produced a series of paintings um, all, all in oil in this particular case, executed on repurposed canvases, some of them that I have found on the curb and some that I have thrifted from the thrift store um, that, that I had gotten before the pandemic. So this series of paintings of which I, as I said, I, I show this one that is called spreading and the next one that is called invisible spreading, um, depict also biomorphic shapes that are uh, evocative as well of islands. And my paintings, um, yeah, unfortunately it's a very sad, uh, sad thing, but my ruminations were about how I see we are adapting to internal or the bodies, adapting to internal and external factors that pollute or, or alter their nature. And I felt that it was a metaphor for our bodies, submission to a virus invasion. Um, so as I indicated before, I feel that I borrow from my past days when I was a science researcher. So these surfaces are very organic. All right, where some of the marks remind us of metabolic pathways and organelles in living cells. Um, and much of what happens in these surfaces resembles the way COVID has spread into our bodies and our lives. So next slide, please. So again, much of what I described before also applies to this invisible a spreading painting that again, I, um, I, I mentioned that it was run in oil uh, or it was executed in oil. The mark making the thicker layers of oil paint reflect my rage to what was happening with the virus and with the uncertainty and frustration that brought to our lives. The smaller mark making is evocative of the spreading of the virus through the air or via droplets, something that we became obsessed about, that much uh, experts about. Working with oils and oil sticks and adding thicker layers, I feel I almost use these surfaces as scapegoats for the overwhelming sentiments that I was experiencing. Frustration, grief, anger, sadness, and finally, acceptance for the small things that I could really control. For example, what I painted. In fact, a painting that is not in the show that was acquired by a collector or a friend of mine is titled, I Can Only Control This Today, because that's exactly how I felt. I, I felt that there was nothing I could do, um, you know, during COVID times. And I meditated a lot about our, about our false sense of security and command, which was more obvious during the pandemic. But if we could, we could argue it applies to normal times too. So I feel that eventually the pandemic made my mind shift again to become more appreciative of the moment by moment, be more frugal, be more attuned with nature and being thankful for the abundance of beauty and comfort that nature gives us. So next slide, please. So these and the next painting are both, again, from, uh, from the climate crisis period, and they are painted with acrylic media on cardboard, and will be the last ones that I will show on this talk. Um, so this one, as you see, is called We All Live, and it's an especially bright and cheerful image. Perhaps this painting is a reminder that all our lives, those of humans and those of all the other animal species, flora, insects, and every single living thing 
on planet Earth. We are all interconnected and our future is beautifully intertwined. I believe that climate crisis resolution is an ethical and moral obligation that we humans have to our future generations and to all the other innocent species that are suffering from the climate crisis in our communities and in our world. It is an ethical and moral obligation to all those with whom we share our home, our beloved planet Earth. So next slide and last one. The title of this painting is Reimagining Our World. And this is what we, I, I invite you to do. Based on the latest reports from the UN, the United Nations, of, uh, uh, although there have been a lot of actions and policies that have been placed, put in place that have helped reduce the carbon emissions tendencies in recent years, the current policies are not enough to avoid in this century an increase of three degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels when we should now go higher than 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid catastrophic consequences to all affected ecosystems. So we need bigger changes at all levels. We need individual lifestyle changes and systemic changes. Yes, change is imperative in all sectors, all industries, including energy, buildings, food, transportation, everything, everything that we do. What gives me hope, you might ask? The extreme weather disasters have made more evident the reality of the climate crisis and the deniers are less. Simply, it has been reduced. Most people, no matter where they sit, they are convinced that the reality, that the climate crisis is a reality. Also, and very unfortunately, the pandemic crisis exposed our vulnerability and the risks that our society has. And we could use those lessons for the climate crisis. The climate crisis is object of many conversations at all levels, and especially with younger generations. In contrast to a global massive virus invasion, the climate crisis can be solved with solutions that are attainable and that they do not require any technology that we do not already have. And that's a wonderful news. It can be done. Now talking about art, which is the topic of today's talk, I believe that any form of art finds the audience in a place of contemplation and somehow vulnerability. Art invites the viewer to feel, to empathize, empathize, to dream, suffer, imagine other realities. And in fact, it can, I believe, impact a person irreversibly to think differently, to act differently. Artists can bring to attention dilemmas that society faces, creating questions to those dilemmas, but without necessarily the expectation of a solution. Art gives the artists an opportunity to join others already engaged on social and environmental issues and inspire new people into the urgent need for change, acting as catalyzers for action. My last thoughts are, my humble hope is that contemplating my work can remind you that while there are many misfortunes going on in the world, each of us have a choice, choice to change something big or small that will impact something else or someone else. And that that will have a ripple effect toward a better future where the climate crisis is resolved. If we change at an individual level and if we share that with others, we can impact others at an individual and societal level. And if we then do the same with those in power, systemic change is possible. As the UN, recently puts it, our climate is our future, our future is in our hands. And that is my last message to you. Again, thank you and continue to be safe and creative, whatever you are. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Adriana. That was beautiful and inspiring. Thank and I you. really appreciate the way that art 
has that power, has that power to have people stop and think and realize and rethink and explore and connect. So thank, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, we love to take some questions. You're welcome to raise the hand um, and use that feature. Or if you'd like to just unmute yourself, I think that's fine too. So trap them in the chat if you'd like someone else to read it. Love. I'm sorry. Are you asking me to read? Oh, no, no, no. I was oh, oh, asking sorry. other people to share <laughs> questions, sorry. but I'm mostly seeing in the chat a lot of accolades and a lot of gratitude. So yeah, I'm echoing that sentiment. Um, and maybe I'll start with a question while um, people think on it if they have uh, ideas or questions or comments they want to bring up. Um, I think this is, oh, sorry, I just turned my video off for a second. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to just go ahead with my video off for one moment. I think you probably get this question often, but what's your concern with like the archival quality or the, the like acid free kind of stuff when you're painting on cardboard? What's the point? Like, do you, are you worried about that at all? Okay. From a point of view, you mean of, um, I guess, longevity of the artwork? Whatever the point of view is, yeah, that people have that concern about. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, well, uh, um, okay, I have several thoughts about that. I, I hope I answer your question. So, uh, first of all, I paint on cardboard, and what I do to uh, isolate the cardboard that could have some acidic elements, if you will, and the paint is I add acrylic gesso. And uh, so that it, it seems to be working pretty well. So because as an uh, isolative, you know, isolation uh, layer. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could use no paint at all for, you know, my, my, my to make it pure sustainable. But, you know, I live in a world in which I'm not of the grid. I mean, like, you know, we, we have to, it's either no painting at all <laughs> or do something that is a bit more um, ecologically okay. Uh, but but in any case, to go back to your point, I, I use that. I use acrylic gesso, and and that seems to be pretty to add um, a level of um, you know um, conservancy, if you will, to the to the painting. And and in fact, I mean it's interesting because sometimes again, I I, I maybe twist a bit your your question. And sometimes people ask me about the longevity or the expiry of my paintings, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I can, I, I mentioned, well, for example, one very well-known example of uh, working cardboard is the monk, the scream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that I've seen in Oslo, it, it, actually uh, monk has several, um, you know, versions, but in any case, that is a painting that it was executing on cardboard. And, uh, and I, I would say, you know, it, it, it's coming up pretty well. It's, it, it's a good, you know, um uh proof that uh you know the test of time is, is working yeah. <laughs> uh, but but at the same time another um uh, thing that pops in my head when i hear that question is like sometimes humans we are so so uh you know obsessed about the longevity of things especially things that are going to you know like leave us you know, live longer than us. Yes. Like, like, and again, I, I don't mean this with this respect to the art, but uh, in uh, right now with the situation that we have with uh, our world, uh, in a world that it, it, that in a way is rapidly expiring, that there is so much that is expiring in, in the way we know it. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like you know it's ironic and it's it's it's, <laughs> it's really trivial to be paying so much attention to an object of art. That's really my thought. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. I love that take. Thank you. We had a question in the chat about your experience in Iceland, what you liked about it and what was what stood out for you. Um, my it was, as I said in the in the talk, it was life changing. Um, it, it was so different from anything that I had seen. Uh, I'm a city person. I lived in a city in Buenos Aires. Um, it's a big city, huge, huge city with a lot of buildings, and, but a lot of parks too. And my father was very 
I always say that he was an environmentalist ahead of his time. So, and we had a beautiful park very close to our house. So I, I was able to go there, but in a way uh, he was also germophobic. So I couldn't play in the playground, although he showed me insects, but it, so my experience was always a bit more, you know, very curated or take, you know, careful. I mean, he was always taking care of me. Uh, so by the time, obviously, that I came here, you know, we live close to the river, we go to the mountain, uh, we experience more nature. But in Iceland, nature is at your face. It's like, you know, you're a speck. <laughs> Of, uh, you really feel the connection with nature. There is uh, so much power, and it's also the power of it because the the geothermal, you know, uh, energy uh, is is amazing. When you walk, uh, you know, certain places with geysers, that I'm sure there are places here too, but over there it's more abundant, right? Um, Ninety percent, I believe, of the warming of the heating of the houses. Is, is being run by a geothermal, um, you know, by the, the, the water. Um, geothermal uh, heating, yeah. Uh, and uh, so you see that, you see those, the, that water, you know, <laughs> that, that could burn you alive, popping, you know, in different places while you walk and the, 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 the thought, the, and you saw it probably last year, the, one of the volcanoes was, um, it's really active and tourists were there filming all the time. I mean, it, it, it's, and, and then you also have uh, continuously earthquakes, uh, uh, small earthquakes. Uh, so the, the power of nature, it was so amazing. So, you know, it, 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 it was so overpowering that, um, you know, it, it really changed me. And um, a beautiful, a beautiful, and uh, the people are also amazing. Uh, a lot of tourists or a lot of people that are living there, um, that uh, like Rosanna here, uh, that fall in love. I, I think that if the weather was a bit <laughs> problematic, it was a bit less cold, I probably also would love to be there. Uh, because it's, 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 it's a pure nature, is the way I see it. Yeah, but anyway, but, but anyway, there are many, uh, many interesting uh, stories also, because, for example, the water smells like rotten eggs. That's something that sometimes is forgotten when people travel, then, you know, it's all the... Uh, so it's a very interesting thing to also experience, like when you're having a shower, uh, you know, you you smell. <laughs> the wow! <sort> of <laughs> Although those things that make you like, oh, you know, you're in a different place. Yeah. Um, and um, and the city is beautiful and very developed, but the moment that you go out on the road, is is you know, uh, it's amazing. It's nature, and it's nature taking over. You're you're nothing there. <laughs> so, you know, if you let it, you're nothing. So, it, it, but um, it, it is beautiful. I hope that people can can see it even if it's not traveling you know like with the uh, videos in youtube or something mm -hmm. like that yeah we we really have, live with a very a powerful force the force of the earth that it's pretty remarkable when that's shown to you and that's brought face you're brought face to face with the power of it yes yes because that, that is when you really also re if you did it before mm -hmm. i guess you you put yourself in the place it's like you we are here not only we are here temporarily mm -hmm. like you know we are in the time past you know over the course of the centuries or, or the millions of years uh we are here only for a short time it's like a millisecond Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes we feel like, oh, you know, we are so important and everything is so relevant. And, and if you put it in that perspective, it's like, oh, my God, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. This is really where the, where the important is, the important mm -hmm. part of, of, the, of the world we live is. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, if there's other people who would like to ask questions, please feel free to. I still have more. I'm <laughs> happy to continue to ask away, but- I'm pouring the water. I'm just <laughs> watching to see if anyone is, is jumping I like, in. I like that somebody's saying it's suffering the water. Yeah, it's suffering the water, yeah. the one that smells. 
and it's good. I mean, I, I got used and I, I even, you know, have the memory, uh, like I love to go back and I even mind it. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's a good memory. Mm -hmm. It's a good memory. It reminds but, you that the world is a big, different, broad place. Yes, it's a broad place, yes. So you have yes. a oh, yes. go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, as I've been now starting to learn more about your work and your forms, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. I'm just curious because I see these forms and, and how immersed you are in them and these bodies of water. And I just wondered, is there any sort of um, like, like self-reflection in them? Any type of self-portraiture? Does that ever come to your mind or just wondering? Thank you, Robin. Uh, and it's good to see you by the way. I love your in the presence of trees. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yes, yeah, as you know. CJ Laurie. <laughs> yes. Uh, I enjoy that so much. Um, um, I guess the short answer is not necessarily, but I have a theory that every uh, uh, artist, every artist, no matter what we do, we have musicians here. I think uh, we'll hear. Uh, hi. Um, I believe that every artist in the work, in their work, it puts something that is self, a self-portrait of, of somehow. Sometimes when people, I, I, it's my observation, when people do, you know, even uh, landscapes or the portrait of somebody else, I believe that many times you, you are self-referring. I guess, I don't know if it's because we see ourselves so much, we are so much in our head, right? Um, so, of course, it, it has to be, there must be a component. Now, I, I, I'm not consciously doing that, but my, the thoughts are mine. Whatever I'm thinking about, you know, the climate crisis is, is mine. So, we could argue, it's myself, <laughs> my self-portrait, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but because, again, it's not representational, and if it's a bit representational, it's more about these aspects that I told you about. Um, and again, they might be very uh, informed by, but again, my past, the cells that I've seen, the things that I studied, right, in science, and also this uh, immediacy or this, you know, very strong connection that I got with Iceland. And um, yeah, that's probably it. No, th thank you. That's really good because I, I'm, I, I could see all these forms emerge and I was very curious about that. Um, one other quick question. Um, I love your titles and mm. the, ti the title of your show, can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, it's funny. <laughs> I, 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 it's I, sort I, of I, playful in its own way too. I, I, it just really caught my eye. Well, I, I like, uh, titles that are uh again well let me start by saying like when i think about uh about the titles for my paintings i think a lot of you know i i, I don't put I, I rarely put a title it, it has to be you know it has to have meaning and uh uh the same was with the you know with the show uh but very early on i i, I chose that because um I felt, first of all, they are topographies, like they are geographies. They look to me or they could be thought of as topographies. But uh, I was thinking again, I mean, these two things, climate crisis and pandemic that are in a way intertwined. There are aspects, and I don't know, maybe we could talk about that, but um, those are calamities and they are collective. <laughs> but so I was playing with those words and I came up with that. I reconsidered at some point because I felt that it could be a bit too negative or too doomsday type of, mm -hmm. but, but in the end I felt, you know, well, that's the title that I, I'm giving it. I like it. Thank, Thank you. you. Adriana, you and I did speak a little bit about how do those two um, 
calamities or misfortunes interact for you in thinking about like what what ties them together the COVID-19 pandemic and the and the climate crisis well in, in my work the work is a bit similar i guess because uh, imagery or, or or maybe visually if you think about it um i've been observing obviously it has certain elements um that are you know my the mark makings right the dots mm -hmm. uh like in one series i'm thinking of them as virus and in the other one as explorations or, or or things of the sort but um obviously at a, another level at the human level at the collective uh, calamity level they are connected because uh they're both striking uh, the communities that usually are the ones that suffer the most and the first in every situation, in every calamity that happens in the world. And those are communities of color, communities, you know, with less resources. They are always the, the losers. Um, if there is any winner, I mean, I, I, I was uh, telling, I believe you, Adrian, I, I go to a lot of webinars or podcasts or I listen to about climate crisis and, um, you know, trying to find ways to, you know, to, to do things and to share those solutions, if you will, and also be informed because it's, it's important. Um, and um, I recently went to one that they were talking about climate winners and climate losers, but it's mostly losers, right? Losers. <laughs> We all lose, yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, and that's the most unfortunate thing. And, and you and I, I believe, also chat a bit about the fact that, uh, although I don't like to refer to because I don't want to quote other other, um, you know, art that maybe not everyone agrees with. But um, the the movie uh, "Don't Look Up" <laughs> made me think also about the the fact that you know it was made for climate crisis but then it came up during the pandemic and or after the pandemic actually and, and we realize that most of what happens unfortunately uh which shouldn't happen like politicization politicization of the calamity of the crisis occurs and and those things are unfortunate so there are a lot of elements and they all apply to humans in a very terrible way and uh, science is at their essence uh the only thing that i can say is that uh being at the expense of a virus that appears out of nowhere right or uh, all of a sudden appears in our lives is one thing until the science comes up to combat it but climate crisis is a different thing climate crisis is a question of will mm -hmm. it's a question of whether we want to do it because it's convenient to our pocket <laughs> and and that is unfortunate mm -hmm. yeah thank you i think that's um we're hearing some of this in the chat also that's just the, the the issue is a social issue and um it's humans in addition to other species that will be affected by it often the most vulnerable yeah uh, and that well that's, that's the other thing what, what breaks my heart is to know that uh animals and um, um, flowers and insects we are losing insects mm -hmm. you know that are uh, like crazy in the hundreds mm -hmm. um every year and uh it breaks my heart because it's true that nature adapts yeah nature adapts if we all go i'm, I'm sure something like a moss like some sort mm -hmm. like a cockroach will be there but i don't know if <laughs> We, we can afford this uh, terrible experiment of pushing and pushing and pushing, you know, the, the envelope mm -hmm. uh, until, you know, maybe the ecosystems will not be able to adapt. I think that that's what the UN is telling, right? The IPCC uh, reports, um, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Crisis of the UN, the United Nations, they have been putting report after report after report about you know, how um, of all sorts, but in general, the latest ones have to do with the adaptation. Uh, and there is a point in which, you know, if we increase the temperature of the planet too much, those many of the ecosystems will not be able to survive. Mm -hmm. 
you're so informed. Thank you for, for firing us all up. And I wonder if you could just end also with what is something that is inspiring you. I mean, you spoke a little bit about that at the beginning, um, but what are you looking, what are you looking for and what are the things that you're taking on to? Um, well, uh, I'm also <laughs> I'm also curating shows currently uh, uh, of a group that is called I3C for Inspiring Change for Climate Crisis. Some of the artists are here: CJ Laurie, <laughs> uh, let me see, Luna, Shelby. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I forgot any, but uh, those are the, one I, the, the ones that I see. Um, we are uh, re very actively, uh, you know, proposing uh, exhibits that will continue to inspire climate uh, change for climate crisis in different venues, in different places. We have an upcoming show in July 25th, I believe, um, to July to September at the Unbound Visual Arts, um, actually uh, support or uh, uh, hosted by the Unbound Visual Arts, but uh, it will take place in Art House Gallery in Austin. Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, on June 1st, we will have a panel, an artist panel. 13 of the uh, I3C artists are going to be participating in a, what I hope it will be a wonderful panel in which we will talk about what we do, each of us, uh, how we fire ourselves up, and which will share solutions, and hopefully the community will share some ideas for change for climate crisis. So there is a lot. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure the, the website is up and running for the group. Um, and I know you, I see Adrian putting a lot of, um, you know, the information there. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those are the that, those are the main things. So I, I, I'm pretty pretty busy. <laughs> I have a I have a lot of cardboard <laughs> that is waiting for me to do something with it. But I, I you know, it's it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm giving you a thumbs up. Yeah, but it's a good but it's a good complication. I used to be very busy in the corporate world. And now I'm very happy that every morning I wake up and I'm very busy with something that I feel, um, you know, it could potentially, you know, be be good, hopefully, for everyone. And again, uh, and it's because I am I believe so much in this problem. Yeah. If somebody, if somebody came and, and told me, Adriana, like you know, shut up and you know, this is what we have to do, and this is I would say, yeah, let's go for that. But but I, I don't know. I think that at this point is the more the merrier. Uh, if we start local, and we move up. If we vote well, if we continue to normalize the the topic in the conversation, that is the best that we can do. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I think yeah, if you guys would all attend this uh, upcoming June first event, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to share what you're all doing. Also, what what inspires you? What Please. makes you? Move we will ahead. never shut up. Yeah. Awesome. And um, so we look forward to hosting the, the uh, panel of I three C artists, and um, we also look forward to continuing to have your work on our walls. So come by if you're local to come see the work at the Multicultural Arts Center Gallery or sit, check it out online on our virtual gallery, which is going to be up in perpetuity. So take a look at multiculturalartcenter.org. And if you're interested in learning more about the center, take a look at the newsletter sign up, follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Um, and the next, we're having um, a busy summer of programming, performing arts and uh, free events outside in our park. So you are welcome to drop by and come see the next show in our gallery, which is called Young Cuba by artist and activist Don Moeller. So we're looking forward to having continuing the legacy of activism in our gallery. Thank you. So hey. thank you very much, everyone who called. Thank you all Have for a coming. wonderful day. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you.